Welcome to Direction Correct, a people's podcast with Colin Scott. Today's guest, nobody. Thanks to our sponsors, Worklytics. Generate actionable insights from work data while protecting your privacy using workplace analytics with our partners, Worklytics. I really can't stand just going to movies in general. Like I, I've, I, I could count the number of movies I've seen in a theater on one hand in the past decade, and I can only really think of two. Wait, it's called like Inside Out or something like that about the people that control their minds. It's like a Disney Pixar movie. The little creatures control people's minds. Uh, like like a psychological sort of thing. Maybe it's called Psych. I don't remember. And the Beatles, Let It Be, or something like that, about the guy that gets struck by lightning or whatever. And you can tell how much I really enjoyed this movie. It, it, was, it was, I walked out, I was like, man, it's okay. I mean, the, I think that just the whole movie industry, for the large part, since streaming services have come around, has really kind of bottomed out a lot. But are there any, are there any movies that uh, you haven't seen that you wish you had seen? Or like cultural like magnets. So I, I have one. I'm almost afraid to share it because I, of the potential blowback from the audience. Actually, two, two different movies that are cult class. Not even really cult classics. Just really popular movies that I have not seen and I kind of refuse to see. One is The Godfather, and the other is The Big Lebowski. I don't know if I've ever seen The Godfather. I, I, I gotta believe I've seen it, but obviously it didn't resonate with me. Big Lebowski, love it. It's, it's great. You got the, the dude peeing on the carpet, all sort of great stuff. I mean, I even know like Big Lebowski things just because I know people have talked about it so much. So, like, I know what happens in the movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I haven't actually seen it. I, I was at a restaurant what, what, uh, a few weeks ago and I saw like the dude walked in. You know, the dude. Uh, yeah, the what, dude. What, Bridges, whatever his name is. He would like this guy would like look if if he was he was must have been trying to look like the guy because he looked exactly like them. Like, why are you going straight for this big Lebowski vibe? <laughs> That's wild. Well, I'm wondering, like, is, are there any movies that you haven't seen, or maybe even any books? Yeah, like um, that you haven't read that you wish you had read. Movies. Uh, we'll start there. Uh, I've never seen Silence of the Lambs. Everyone's a good one. That's actually that one holds up too. It's a good movie. Man, and then one, one, once again, it's like like you mentioned. I'm almost like militant against seeing it. I don't know yeah. why. No, no rationale behind that. Just never seen it. I've never seen Moneyball. I got to check this out. I may prioritize that. But it, as far as books, actually, I have uh, two on my nightstand right now that I just cannot get to. Like one is 1984 Orwell. Uh, I, I think it's probably apt for this time <laughs> in our society. Then another book on my nightstand that uh, is just kind of like sitting there is uh, Everybody Loves This Town, about the early days of uh, the Seattle grunge movement. Uh, I, I read a little bit of it, like your first few pages, and it's like essentially a series of interviews, and it looks really, really good. Uh, uh, otherwise, like, like other things on my list are... Uh, Hawking's A Brief History of Time. Is there's a book called Sapiens about the history of yeah. humans? Yeah, um, all Noir, you know, Ferrari or whatever. I can't remember how to pronounce it. You, you've seen that or uh, read that one already? Yeah, and his other book, um, he has a few of them. I think I've read two, the Homo Deus as well. It's very good. I mean, other than those, like there's like other like cultural touchstones, like uh, Hamlet, Shakespeare's Hamlet. Never read Hamlet, never was exposed to it. I understand, like, it's kind of like Big Lebowski for you. You understand the context and yeah, you understand like the main points of it, as well as like much ado about nothing. Never read that either. I just thought that was an expression. <laughs> <laughs> what What about you, Matt? Are there any books out there that uh, just like a blind spot to you? You know, it's funny. I was actually going to say 1984. That's weird that really? you both, but, but just and also Brave New World because they're both kind of things I've always heard through the cultural lexicon and seem to be relevant to this moment, but I actually haven't read them. Brave New World's great. Uh, yeah. Adelaide Huxley, I think his name is. Yeah. Writer. Yeah. yeah. And then the other is like, it's one of those things that's like better in theory than in practice, but I always wanted to read like presidential biographies, but I've never actually read one. But I want to be like one of those guys that's read presidential biographies. I don't know. I, it's like a weird thing, but like idiosyncrasy. Well, who would you read? I don't know, I'd probably do like a Lincoln one, maybe like a Kennedy or a, you know, 
I don't know, any of the ones that like either had like a very important presidency or like a very controversial presidency. I think both of those would be very interesting. All right. You probably don't start off with like James Van Buren, you know, R.I.P. Yeah, but <laughs> Calvin <laughs> Coolidge. <laughs> All I know is his name. I don't even know he did anything. Uh, James Burke has a book. It's about the interconnections of our founding fathers. Couldn't quickly Google it. But essentially, yeah, like how they're all related. They met in bars and, uh, you know, essentially formed this union based on their interconnection. So it's it's a bit of like network analysis as well. Uh, it's like, yeah, I was like, oh, there's the tie. Oh, my God. There's a tie somewhere in there. Well, I mean, th those are the books that I gravitate towards. Like, either, uh, oh boy, it's nerdy as hell, but, like, I'll read these. You know those, like, R books that have, like, a bird on the cover? I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> I, 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 I fucking eat them up. I love them so much. Really? Oh, yeah. Like, it's it's not exactly uh, bedtime reading for your dinosaur-loving son. Or maybe it is. Maybe, maybe he would just go straight to sleep reading. He probably would. But there is a book by Samuel L. Jackson. It's called Go the Fuck to Sleep. <laughs> People have given us that as gifts before. But yeah, I'll, I'll read those or other, you know, nonfiction. A lot of like network analysis books that deal with like different studies, like essentially combinations of studies like Matthew Jackson, uh, uh, Alex Pentland. Those are two of my favorite ones right there. As well as uh, Rob Cross, he's got a, a a couple of good ones and more coming out. I saw he published a micro stress book. I don't really know what it's about. I guess it's kind of like The Godfather, where maybe we'll never know. I don't know. We may never know. How do you feel about Elon Musk in general? In general, I have like two minds about him. I have like the old school Elon Musk that's like yeah. doing crazy wild innovative stuff, which I just fucking love. And then I have like the more recent Twitter troll Elon Musk. I'm like, <laughs> meh. You know, I still admire him, but I also think like I feel like he's creating unnecessary division, and I'm just not really about that. You know, if if we could if we could tamper down that in society, I would be much happier. Yeah, I mean, like, from, like, a general perspective, like, is society better for social media? Like, we're more connected. We can learn from each other in general terms. But and you know my feelings about this. We talked about it before. I think it just makes people horrible human beings, and I do not enjoy that aspect of how, it, like, reinforcement learning. Because there's technical reasons behind this. It didn't have to be this way. But controversial things and, you know things that make people like outrage they get more clicks they get yeah. more likes and therefore their algorithms actually incentivize people to do that more and uh, have you ever heard of the charlie munger quote he's like warren buffett's partner at berkshire hathaway it says if you show me the incentives i'll show you the outcome i love that quote and i think social media is just another testament to that as like if you give people the incentives to be outraged guess what you're going to have is you're going to have an outrage machine Oh, are, are they are they providing the incentives to be outraged, or are they just trying to maximize some sort of engagement function, which leads people to be outraged? Is is it like a mediation step? I.e., the like, thing is, like, the longer you're on the set, the longer you're on the site, the more advertisements we can essentially sell. I I think it, it it's the the analogy to from like AI to the paperclip maximizer. Have you ever heard this? No. no, no. Right. So the, the thought is like you might build an AI and it, it you just give it one simple objective to like maximize the productivity of making paper clips oh. and it kills all the human beings just to make more paper clips and like it's an unintended consequence. <laughs> I I feel like that's the same thing as like if they're trying to maximize user engagement, but it has all these unintended consequences. At a certain point you have to think it's a feature, not a bug. Like they're actually trying to make this happen. Oh yeah, I mean, like especially the, like the phone, be it social media or whatnot, like it has the same effect on a two year old as it does like an eighty two year old, which is really insidious. I probably need to get away from this sort of thing. But we have like two essential, or not essential, but two related stories. So one is Elon six Elon Musk six rules for insane productivity. There's no source here, so it may not be associated with Elon at all. I don't know. Be apocryphal. 
It, it could be. It could be. So, how do you feel about Elon? Either uh, take this information in or totally dismiss it as you will. But uh, number one, avoid large meetings. Boy, this is so true. Uh, you get in these meetings like twelve people, and it's just it's a shit show. Yeah. Well, let's let's go through a few more and okay, okay, make some commentary. Does that work? Yeah, absolutely. They're they're all largely related to meetings or you know, at least organizational functioning. Uh, number two, leave a meeting if you're not contributing. Number three, uh, forget the chain of command. That's essentially, uh, uh, go to who has the data or information you need. Uh, four, be clear, not clever. Five, ditch frequent meetings. Six, use common sense. Yeah, I think if there was like an undercurrent that ran through all of these is like be mindful of your time, right? Yeah. And the, the one that's kind of an outlier, which I I think is kind of curious, is the forget the chain of command. And I think this kind of falls into the ask for forgiveness, not permission type of mentality. But I think most of these are just, you know, if you're wasting your time consciously, don't do that. Yeah. Um, I, boy, a lot of divergent thoughts here because I, I've seen like meetings out of control. It essentially just, I, I think what he's really getting here is speed, the speed of decision making, speed of insights, just speed of doing anything. To your point, so there's a quote from uh, Churchill essentially says, like, I don't fear action. I fear inaction. So actually just doing something that's way better than you just like being stagnant. If, if I were to go to an organization as, as a consultant and just kind of try to understand where they're going wrong, I think one of the first things I would want to see is their organizational hierarchy, their, their structure. And if you saw a bunch of like sort of like uh, spaghetti strings of like individual managers reporting to individual managers reporting to you know IC to IC. That is the chain of command that you really need to avoid. That's that's what really slows everything down. Well, and like from a people analytics lens, doing spans and layers analysis, yeah, is a really good way of identifying those type of situations. But just to build on something you were saying about you know being more productive. When I think about this from like a, a cultural dimension from a second, like I just gather from this that Elon Musk does not like this consensus driven cultures. He probably prefers, you know, either a consultative model or just a single decision making model. And I just wonder if these rules for productivity could even be helpful or hurtful in a consensus driven decision making culture. That's intriguing. And I, I think that you are right that the the way organizations operate depend on their overall mission, vision, strategy, and structure, which dictates the overall outcome. So if like you are a, a bank or, or if, okay, yeah, the, the bank that just failed in uh, Silicon Valley, you don't want a whole bunch of wild decisions based on, you know, individual people making, you know, radical choices, this sort of thing. You need to be a bit more conservative, slower paced let's slow the wheels down, make a good decision at the end, get input from everybody. But if you want to be highly innovative, may be first to market, that sort of thing, follow Elon's rules because those are the ones that uh, really make for, you know, you go to outer space, may believe tunnels. I, I guess in some respects, Twitter, who knows? Well, it's just, there's a, there's a time and a season for everything. I think it's kind of the wisdom that there's to be gained there. I was going to change subjects. Yeah, let's change subject. This also relates to a, a recent article that we came across uh, called "When uh, Survivorship Bias Meets Superstitious Learning." People often learn from the success stories of founders, say like Elon Musk, and they they tend to be biased. So on one hand, you have uh, selection based on the dependent variable, which is you're only identifying people that are successful in a field. And you also have a selection on the independent variable, which essentially boils down their success down to one or two factors, such as, uh, I don't know, people that dropped out of college, they, they go on to success. You're like, like Michael Dell, or it's like, well, if I drop out of college, I'll be successful too. But people try to learn from these people, you know, successful people, and they, they gather only a small set of good practices and ignore the larger systems and processes in place that actually made that person successful. Yeah, I have uh, some kind of 
conflicting feelings even with my myself about this topic of you know like when when is doing something right the exception and when is it the rule kind of thing and and so i i love survivorship bias i love you know saying like any anytime i've been asked to do analysis of like who made it to be an executive at the organization right yeah. and all the steps in the letters like the first thing you have to take into consideration is survivorship bias right but then there's the other kind of on kind of a personal level that I always think of because I've been doing these mentoring sessions again right now, and people are like saying, "Well, it's really hard to predict like what's going on in the economy and all the changes with AI, and I'm not sure what I need to do in my career." And mm-hmm. you know, you used to be able to say like, "Hey, I could w- hitch my wagon to like a really innovative company, and I would be set for at least another five to ten years." But some of the most innovative companies are still doing layoffs right now, and the thing I've been telling people is. You've got to bet on yourself first, uh, mm-hmm. before anything, before you're betting on your organization, before you're betting on, you know, dollar, the dollar is being the, you know, universal currency of the land, even though they're apparently trouble with that right now and all this kind of stuff. <laughs> you got to bet on yourself first. E- survivorship bias be damned. Like maybe you're not Michael Dell, maybe you're not Mark Zuckerberg and dropping out of college might not be the right thing for you. But hey, if you do have high conviction about something, and you do believe that you can go and accomplish it, and you think that taking a risk might be the best way to do that, I won't begrudge somebody from doing that either because I would always encourage them to bet on themselves. Does that make sense? It, it, it does. It, 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 I think what you're pointing out is that uh, the, these success stories, while it, it could be just a small fraction of folks, it did happen. It did happen for these people, and you can make it happen too if you bet yourself. I, I think that the, the the overarching theme is yes, it did happen for these people, but you're also ignoring the fact that they are really smart, they had really good connections, they hustled, all this sort of stuff, and not like uh, not not throw them on the bus, but like the guy that's like make your bed in the morning, <laughs> which is hey, it's yeah. probably good advice just to keep your house clean. But I mean, there's a line in it that I really like. It says trying to learn from extraordinarily successful folks is often worse than learning from those who are merely successful. I think the thing is, like, when I'm trying to give people advice or talk to them, and I'm not trying to tell them to be the next Mark Zuckerberg, I feel like that's completely unreasonable to expect to be that person. But I am trying to help them be successful. And and yes. so, you know, I think that as long as we're giving advice and or trying to, like, follow the research, maybe maybe following the research on what it's like to be, you know, one of the 400 billionaires in the world, maybe that's not great advice, but... How to just have a good life and how to be successful is probably a little bit more helpful. If I had to think about the people that I know that have turned out, you know, really successful, it, it personally, they they've essentially built up a skill set behind them and found a moment to apply that very successfully. So that they had a knowledge base. Essentially, uh, when they talk about baseball, like practice meets opportunity leads to success. So it's like you you go in the batting cage, you swing the bat a lot. Next thing you know, you get a curveball right down the wheelhouse. You, you jack it out, this sort of thing. It's like the notion, the harder I try, the luckier I get kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But, I mean, there, there's a flip case there as well. Like Angela Duckworth, like grit, fantastic. Persevere, persevere, keep going, keep going. A lot of people need to quit. A lot of people, like you can reinvest your efforts into something that you will be successful in later on this guy like this simon cow on uh this is american uh idol idol would say like hey you're trash <laughs> you need to sing, singing because this is not for you right now so well, while while yes if you persevere get your ten thousand hours in you could be moderately successful to some degree maybe it's well, not the I, right I, path for you persistence is is a great quality to have and betting on yourself is a great quality to have if there's evidence behind the reason why you're doing it. Like if the world is telling you you're a horrible artist, <laughs> you know, you're, you're terrible. Persistence probably isn't going to fix your lack of ability, right? This is where like I get all the people saying like you're a horrible podcast host. Yeah. Like I'm going to keep going, man. I'm going to keep going. We're going to get those repetitions. We're going to get the 10,000 hours, you know, and and by the end of it, by golly, we are going to be average at best. (laughs) 
well, I mean, like, uh, along a similar line, so, like, we, we, we funnel all these kids into college currently to hopefully get a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. But, I mean, the world is changing, right? We yeah. had all sorts of, like, technology coming down, and, like, college is getting way more expensive than it was 20 years ago. Let, let, let's, let's talk about the introduction of generative AI into that equation. Oh, yes, Absolutely. I feel like there's a there's a short term and a long term problem or not problem, but like just consideration of what's going on at the moment. Whereas I think in the short term, colleges are trying to figure out what the heck to do about generative AI. In the long term, generative AI is college. And it's going to be your personalized learning assistant that's going to help you learn whatever you need to learn at a cost structure that is lower than what any other competing technology will be able to provide. Because this, the cost of college is, is asinine. It's insane. It, it's been going, I think, like, you know, percentage points above inflation for decades now. And so, you know, it used to cost a hamburger to go to college, and now it costs three Ferraris to go to college. And <laughs> it's just, it's, it's completely insane. I, I once found one of my father's tuition statements from the University of Texas, and... Kind of, this is a, a, I, I, I don't remember the year. It doesn't really matter, but it was laughable. It was like $200. It was insane, insanely cheap. Of course, you know, the, 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 cost, the dollar isn't the same anymore. And a hamburger yeah. costs a nick all the time and all this sort of stuff. But it's just so prohibitive now. And what, what is the benefit on the back end, especially when you have this sort of like journey of AI? Like, what are you actually learning in college now? is it to write is that a skill in the future that you really need i mean because like you can't just go to any of these sort of like chat gpt and get a really good document but i think this goes in line with a lot of the big trends that organizations are pursuing right now about it used to be you pursued the credential of an individual yeah and now many organizations are pursuing the skills of an individual and the the weird thing about college, and again, I don't have data to back this up, but this is just what I kind of what I perceive is the the cost of the credential has gone up dramatically, yeah. while correspondingly the actual tangible skills that are being taught is decreasing. And therefore, if you're wanting to run kind of a a forward thinking skills based organization, you know, I think that it's an area ripe for disrupt disruption. Because of that, the two competing, you know, the cost going up trend and then the the value of the skills going down trend, that that's going to create opportunities. And I think gender AI is going to be right there to meet the opportunity. Oh, a- absolutely. And I, I think about like uh, like Matt Damon and Goodwill Hunting. Like you, you got your whole education for what could have been the cost of like late fees at the public library. You know, good I, reference, I, by the way. Good reference. <laughs> <laughs> Why well, thank you so much? But I, I think it, it it depends on your goals that that you want to achieve and what what you really want to get out of college. So, what you mentioned like skills that are needed. Uh, do you really need skills for like all the IT work and stuff? Maybe I, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not an expert in that space of you know what sort of things are coming down because like you go like MIT lab and they're building these like quantum computers and stuff that you probably can't learn in a regular book you really need to collaborate this sort of thing right i think that that is like the real benefit to college in a lot of respects you essentially spend four years you know longer and if you want to be a super senior in this sort of thing or go on to grad school uh socializing with people your own age uh debating topics learning a i hate to use the word plethora because i hate the word plethora a vast amount of information uh, so you have like a diverse skill set, and then when you get out, you have this like wide network to draw on to find a job, get things done, exposure to new information, what have you. And when you actually do get to the office, you you have all the, the, this diverse background to draw on, and I, I think that that's where like the real innovative potential comes from from college. You are not stuck in a certain mindset. You can see different op- opportunities around the corner and then instruct AI to help generate ideas in some capacity. Yeah. 
the historical notion of college was it was supposed to be kind of like a respite for an individual to go away from society and to really focus on learning and becoming kind of like the renaissance person of like having a bunch of different things to bring into the fold and then re-enter society as like, you know, reborn as a new person. I don't really think that's what's happening with colleges nowadays. So what I would say is, have you ever heard this this notion that the in- internet increases variance? Internet increases variance. I, I guess the question would be like variance in what? Exactly. It will variance in everything. And so the notion would be kind of use your like MIT example of like quantum computing. Well, you might need 20 years of collegiate education to to understand the cutting edge stuff that's going on there. But also at the same time, you know, you may only need an afternoon primer in Excel to get a data analyst job. Whereas in the past, you may have needed, you know, four years of college or four years of college and a master's degree to be able to do some of those kind of roles. So it, it's increasing the variance of what might be necessary to do a job. It's it's so true. I, I think we, we, we've already experienced it and it's just going to get worse and worse. So like think about people without access to the internet. Now now it's become harder to actually apply for jobs. I, I, I know that a lot of companies take a great amount of care to develop their selection instruments that are both computer friendly and mobile friendly because a large part of their applicant pool will take the assessment on the phone. But if you're talking about like just access to information, the inter- just, internet just makes everything so easy. Like I don't, I'm not breaking any new ground here by any means. Wait, but like, the internet makes things easy. <laughs> it can make things hard too, as we mentioned earlier. Like Chad GPT, it, it's gonna, it's. I, I can't believe any other future other than creating a world of haves and have not. So if you're not taking advantage of it right now. Well, I mean, but within that higher education itself already is creating haves and have nots. I mean, imagine a yeah, person true. who graduates with $250,000 worth of debt versus a person who had their college paid for. That is very much a have versus a have not. It does. It, it puts you in this sort of like, indentured servitude really to continue like all sorts of strain on you and everything it, it, it's also the role of chat gbt and uh we talk about education that now now we're getting into like the world of like crystallized and fluid intelligence as well where the value of that crystallized intelligence is just dropping precipitously you don't need to know these facts on the fly but the ability to think reason connect the dots that's it's gonna be so paramount and even those folks may be left in the dust i don't know yeah maybe the collective intelligence of humanity is about to be usurped by technology but it looks like the european union is trying to slow that down so we'll see what really well, I, yeah i, think I know that- italy just outlawed uh chat gbt i believe and i think other european nations are considering doing something similar i had not heard that i i heard that some like tech folks were trying to get together to like suggest a six months moratorium before you know pursuing any additional you know it just put a pause to ai so we can figure some stuff out like it's never gonna happen like the, the incentives are too great to your point earlier like you're trying to do first to market and all this sort of stuff it's just impossible well like one of the people that was mentoring this week asked me a question kind of along those lines so like well, what's going to happen with like AI regulation and, you know, and jobs and requirements? I was like, everything, everything is <laughs> going to And in probably like five years, we're going to see another Senate hearing where these like crusty old dudes are like, well, if I put in my address, you're going to spit up my social security number or, you know, whatever insane sort of thing they're talking about. And meanwhile, like all the jobs are gone. The tech CEO will say, Thank you for that great question, Senator. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> ah, it's ridiculous. So I wanted to come back to uh, something I was saying earlier kind of about the tech layoff. So you know, I know we talked a little bit about it while it was happening, but I mean, obviously, we, we, we both know people that work in, in a lot of these firms and I just thought it would be in poor taste to start criticizing people kind of as it was happening. But I want to talk to you a little bit about workforce planning, Scott. Um, do you do you have any background in workforce planning? 
some uh, hot workforce planning talk. No, no, I've never gone into any sort of uh, succession planning or anything like that. Because one of the things that I've been noodling on for a while, and I've, I've run it by a few of my workforce planning colleagues, I'm probably writing an article about this, but I haven't quite gotten there yet. Love it. Is about the failure of workforce planning because of all these tech layoffs. And, and my thought, I had a few different kind of scenarios that I think are possible as to why they occurred. And I want to just run them by you and see what you thought. Okay. Um, the first one was with all like, cause like what, what came out is all these tech CEOs said, Hey, after COVID we overhired, right? Well, if you're doing good workforce planning, you aren't over hiring or under hiring, you're hiring to a plan. And so my first scenario is like, well, maybe, maybe workforce planning teams at these tech companies weren't consulted at all. That's probably the Occam's razor type situation. The second possibility is workforce planning functions at these companies were inept and they thought that the companies would just grow forever. And they, there were never, there was never going to be a scenario planning episode where they were saying, Hey, maybe they, you know, things might go south and, you know, nobody was ever consulted. The, the, the next one is, you know, these tech companies actually intentionally overhired to keep talent from their key competitor. Which I think is an interesting notion. And then the fourth is just that tech companies intentionally acquired, like acquired also other companies during this period of time so that ta the talent wouldn't be building competitors down market. So think of like a big tech company right. acquiring a smaller tech firm to so that they don't have to compete with that smaller tech firm's product, right? And so maybe they were doing that so that it wouldn't create down market competitor. All of these are different possibilities from like a workforce planning standpoint, but I did want to bring it up kind of amidst when like, oh, it seems like some of these layoffs have so, sort of cooled off, but I just, I can't help but notice that I think these layoffs have to be some kind of consequence of poor or non-existent workforce planning. I, I, obviously, something went wrong in some capacity, right? Uh, and I, I think there may be a fifth element there of Jones. The fifth element? Is it love? The fifth element. It's trying to go back to my uh, Bruce Willis references. A multi pass. Multi pass. There you go. Okay, there you go. <laughs> which, which is just a, a, a failure to see or, or foresee the drastic economic recession that precipitated after uh, COVID or during COVID. Like, I, I think that a lot of organizations decided to capitalize on a situation where, you know, they saw big business opportunities uh, for whatever reason, the uh, uh, population or, you know, the, the economy was in such a position that they could uh, hire quite a few people and make money perhaps seeing that uh, it, th those good times would not end. But now, now we're seeing the ramifications of this. But I, from like an IO perspective, I, I would say that all this, all this really goes back to e your basics. So like job analysis. So job analysis, understanding what people and the skills people have, and then bubble up to the very top mission and vision strategy. So how do you want to pursue and then everything bubbles down from there, like how you need to fill your positions and the skills of the future, as we used to talk about. I agree. And, and many of these tech companies had the whole roles geared towards the future of work and what it was yeah. going to look like. And so I, I, do, I just look at it and say, if you're doing a scenario planning exercise, one scenario planning is high growth, medium growth, low growth, current growth, and shrinking, right? And you would plan out, you know, or you could just do high growth, low growth, and shrinking or something like that and say, hey, what would we do with our talent strategy according to these three scenarios? And so it had to have been considered if like that, you know, that some kind of economic, you know, con consideration might have to come into fold if they were doing this appropriately. And so it leads me to believe, again, that they were either inept or they weren't doing it at all, which I don't believe or that they had, you know, other things that they cared about that played a role into it. And so I, know, I think a lot of people, you brought up, you know, the Silicon Valley Bank earlier, and we've talked about it on here before. A lot of people are doing kind of post-mortems on what happened to Silicon Valley Bank. Mm -hmm. 
what's the postmortem on, you know, from a workforce planning standpoint? Like, are they going to talk it about talk about it at the next big workforce planning conference? Like, what's the postmortem on why all these things occurred? How can we learn from it? And how can we do better in the future? And I think it's really important that we kind of put the mirror on ourselves and do that sometimes. I, I think that's that's true in all respects of everything we do. Like what went well, what did not go well. And of course, like a ton of people are impacted a- across the tech sector from this. And I, I see it bleeding over into other sectors as well, not just call out tech. But there's lessons to be learned. There's lessons to be learned because like you're talking about like eroding trust in the workforce. Are people going to be more apt to join a large company now? I don't know. And they're not seen as stable or as stable as it's advertised. They'd rather just go yeah. do a bunch of different gigs. You know, I don't know. And that that's a whole new aspect there as well. We got a whole generation of employees, employees or potential employees that went through the pandemic, kind of saw the economic ramifications of it. And so like, damn, I don't need, I can't go to college anymore and now guarantee me a job. I need to have like six different hustles to be, be, pay the bills. Well, and that's where I go back to what we were saying earlier about betting on yourself. Because mm-hmm. I think in kind of not that long ago in the past, there was a time where there was like conventional wisdom on the things that you could do that would remove having a bad life. You, you go to college, you get a job at a stable company, and, you know, things are probably always going to work out for you. Yeah. And I think a lot of those like just conventional wisdom things, it's not that they're not applicable. It's just they're becoming less applicable and, and the world is becoming more uncertain and more dynamic. And therefore, I think it's just really important to just try to stay relevant, have confidence in your own skills, build into a future that may be unknowable, but do the best that you possibly can. Uh, ab- absolutely. And uh, also to your point, like at the same time as like the skills that people need are changing like uh, years ago you, you could be a typist that that, 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 that could be your career i, I type or data yeah. entry data entry something like that and now like you go to the organization on any organization and you like where your grandfather used to work it's like well you get a gold watch after 40 years here it's like no <laughs> that's not for me and that's never gonna happen but yeah like i was i was thinking about this at a prior employer where I went to like one colleague's retirement party. And I realized that that was so strange because I think in a prior era, it was very common to go to someone's retirement party because people could actually retire from an organization where it was so strange because somebody actually had a retirement party. And that, (laughs) that the concept that seemingly, you know, doesn't really even exist anymore, like this one person, made it through the gorge of what it takes to retire at an organization. Oh, man, that's wild. So, like, I'm just thinking back to all the different places I've worked, and I've, I've received way more, this is dark, I've, I've received way more, like, a bill from accounting is dead. <laughs> We're going to have a funeral for Oh, geez. Yeah, we are but, going dark. But more than I've uh, heard, like, Bill from accounting is retiring. Let's all wish him well. Well, on that note, do you want to go? <laughs> I know we kind of been doing nerdery the whole time, but do you want to do some nerdery? Yeah, let's do some nerdery. I came across this article uh, regarding learning agility. Are, are you familiar with the concept of learning agility? You spend I spend time with it. You are? Um, yeah. Yeah, I am. So uh, this article relates learning agility with uh, as a G factor for uh, leadership. So much like Spearman's G, this is an like overarching uh, effect on our overall intelligence, like positive manifold. Learning agility may be the G factor for leadership. Uh, and learning agility comes from business and essentially observations of successful leaders. Therefore, it's atheoretical and largely ignored by academia. But the, the general idea is like exposure to various types of job experiences and opportunities lead to better leadership and uh, your ability to learn, unlearn, and apply this knowledge into new experiences. It's what's really critical for potential uh, assessment of potential of future leaders. While the people that derailed, they're essentially stuck in a comfort zone. They relied on old knowledge, this sort of thing. They uh, got defensive when uh, face with new circumstances. 
the new leaders were able to incorporate new information and obviously like uh, adapt to their situation. Uh, some other notes here. Uh, it essentially encompasses change agility, mental agility, people agility, results agility, and importantly, self-awareness. So being able to reflect on your own abilities. Oh, okay. It, it's not everything to leadership. There's other aspects that are not related to uh, learn agility, but it does go a long way in predicting who will be successful. One of the things I, I find funny about concepts like learning agility is they seem to be kind of the catch-all. Like, hey, I know it when I see it, and therefore, <laughs> oh, that good leader? Yeah, they have learning agility. Oh, that bad leader? They definitely definitely don't have learning agility. And so it, it, it's like one of these things where you can almost self-assign it afterwards. I'm sure there's some science behind it. I, I know I'm probably being overly critical here. But I, I think it like it really just comes down to like, Okay, is someone adaptive versus someone who's unadaptive? Okay, the adaptive person's probably going to outcompete the person who's unadaptive. Is the person who's self aware going to outcompete the person who's not self aware? But I don't see how self awareness and adaptivity are actually the same construct. You know, they, they seem to be pretty independent of one another. And so, I don't know, some of the, sometimes these things I think just, and I think there's like reverse causality to it. Well, like maybe, like he said, could it be the G factor of leadership? What if learning agility is the G factor of intelligence? And what if we're just seeing that, you know, the actual G factor is the G factor of leadership? Well, yeah, th th this article breaks down the relationship of uh, learned agility to uh, overall G, which is inappropriate. It's inappropriate because you, once again, you, you incorporate things like crystallized knowledge and this sort of thing, which is not... In my mind, that that's not intelligence at all. It's really fluid intelligence, and where fluid intelligence meets, uh, say, personality characteristics such as openness. So, uh, not only are you like really smart, you can collect rational rationalize through different aspects, but also incorporate information from all over the place and apply that into new and novel situations. Well, let me kind of go a different direction here for a second. This is just a funny a funny trend I see, which is take wisdom that's been known forever slap a new brand name on it and say that you've come up with something new and you'll have like an awesome academic publishing career. So it's like, you know, grit was just perseverance. You know, the learning agility is just adaptability and persistence. You know, like it's just a, like just rebrand something that you've always known and you'll be famous. Like we, 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 yeah, we should come up with something. You know, like what, what isn't like delayed gratification, like one of the, most solid findings in the history of psychology. Let's come up with a new name for delayed gratification, and we will be so famous. <laughs> I sense that uh, you're really uh, eschewing this. Like, I, I'm kind of jazzed by it. I, I think it's like a really interesting aspect that, uh, you know, get, gets beyond, such, you know, these Ohio State and Michigan studies of, you know, it's just uh, initiating structure and... Yeah. Uh, I, I know I'm coming out like super hard again. I'm not actually against it. I, I think I like all the things that are behind it. Yeah. I, I kind of take issue with it. This is a new discovery, right? Like I, I agree that like, all, I absolutely, we need the factors that make up what they're defining as learning agility. Leaders that have that, absolutely. And if we could find ways of selecting or developing to it yeah. effectively, if we could train generative AI models on how to, self-teach you know managers to be able to do this effectively in real time rather than sending them to expensive learning and development programs like absolutely i'm on board i'm i'm on board 110 percent. yeah i think you're hitting on a lot of issues that the academic world like really doesn't like about the theory like it tends to be fragmented you know it's not theoretically underpinned by you know uh the sound psychological thought and uh, established practices therefore like it's really hard to pin down despite the fact that it is a collection of behaviors, as it were, that are possibly teachable. Some of them feel more personality, uh, stable characteristics otherwise, that uh, are more enduring and less likely to be taught and changed. There are aspects that you can, you can teach people to go out and explore their environment more, whether they do it or not. Yeah. That makes it more difficult. Yeah, I think that came out to more passionate there than I actually feel. <laughs> um, I don't know. I'm kind of amped up right now for some reason. I don't really know why. Well, maybe maybe that's a good kind of segue into our next nerdery topic about the ability to disagree effectively. 
right? And the relationship between psychological safety and disagreement, like I, I won't say that you and I actually disagreed there because I don't think we did. I don't know, do you want to talk at all about like how to disagree with respect and what role psychological safety plays in it? Boy, I, I don't know. That's an interesting question. Obviously, the the, the psychological safety literature uh, is, is pretty clear that th this is the key aspect to being able to function in an organization. Like nothing gets done if people won't communicate. And that seems to be a precursor to actually communicating is psychological safety. So create an environment where people are willing to connect with others, share ideas, this sort of thing. That's that's where innovation, I, I think about innovation quite a bit, That that's where it all starts. Uh, again, this had like an interesting uh, spin on this as well. Uh, I'm trying to recall some of my uh, thoughts here, but it's a, it's a very broad question. I, did you have yeah. a take on it? Well, let me let me let me kind of give it because I, I forgot to reference it. This is from a guy named Jeff Dyer, who I believe wrote a book, "Why Innovation Depends on Intellectual oh, Honesty." I think the reason why this is important and why I think some people, I think they overuse the term psychological safety is you have to ask yourself the question: if you disagree with somebody and you think you're in a psychologically safe environment. Could you actually share that disagreement, even if you knew the other person potentially would, you know, not be happy that you disagreed with them, right? And I would say definitionally, you're probably not in a psychologically safe environment if you couldn't do that. Whereas I think sometimes the co kind of common version of psychological safety is we just all kind of come together and we don't disagree on anything. Yeah, and like I, I know Amy Edinson has like done some like really great work in this space. Uh, it it kind of starts to straddle the line between task conflict and relationship conflict, where like we we can disagree about how to proceed with a task, uh, you know, like battle and like there there's always like this like uh, marketplace of ideas that people talk about to be that to actually you know uh, move things forward. But if that is punctuated with like, and you're an asshole for the, yeah. thinking the way you do, that's a different sort of thing. That's a different animal that, that that's a conversation ender, which I guess is a psychological safety aspect of it. Yeah. Well, I think this goes back to research I did back in my dissertation on 360 degree feedback. And if you dig into the research on like how to give effective feedback, no, he says, give feedback on the behaviors, not the person. And so I don't like what you did, not saying I don't like you. There's a big difference in that. And I think oftentimes when people disagree in the workplace, and th this is where it, it, it's really hard. It, I mean, it, it, this is not easy. And, and anybody who tries to make it out to be easy is is probably wrong. Like when you're disagreeing with someone, sometimes people interpret that as you're giving them feedback on themselves, not on the idea that's being presented. And that's that's tough because it requires both sides of the disagreement to acknowledge one another. I think this is where I, I, I always had a rule of thumb with my teams of saying, assume positive intent. Yeah. Like assume like before assuming like, oh, this person's evil or I hate them or, you know, they hate me or. Like, just assume that they like you and you like them and we're all in this together and we all have a common mission and then dig into it and talk tentatively. And I think like things like crucial conversations become really important. And this is clearly more prevalent in sort of like knowledge jobs where if someone has an idea and starts getting picked apart for it, that that idea is, there's probably a lot of investment both uh, mentally, but also like emotionally in your idea. You, well, it probably stems from other aspects. Like you don't want to be seen with, I, I forget all these references. Like you need for competence, need for acceptance, you know, all these sort of aspects that are critical to our core self evaluations. And mm -hmm. if someone starts picking apart your ideas, now they're, they're, they're picking on you. Well, can I, I actually love this point. I love that you brought it up because this is one of, again, one of the things that I had to coach myself on and I started coaching my team. And like, if you're making a presentation or writing an email about your work, changing the, but what, whatever the English term for it is, saying from my work to the work, because it's so much easier to get feedback on the work than it is the feedback on my work. 
when you're giving me feedback on my work, it's criticism. When you're giving feedback on the work, you're trying to improve it. Like small mental shifts like this can play a big outsized role on how people interpret it. Have you, have you ever seen it like go wrong? I'm trying to like think back of any sort of like conflict in the office where people got really sort of heated. Have, have you ever encountered this sort of situation? Yeah. About, uh, <laughs> how many times did you instigate Cole? Well, I mean, I, I think I've been on all sides of it. I've I've been the one who felt, you know, who yeah. instigated it, been in the, like the manager trying to see other people, trying to be like an arbiter of it. I've been the one who felt attacked myself. I, I think it's, I mean, again, it's, this is why it's hard. It's not easy in the moment of, you know, doing things like being self-aware, assuming positive intent, the work versus my work, all these things, they're hard to do in the moment. It is. And the, the, there's some amount of like uh, emotional intelligence involved in, you know, I guess it's the, probably the thesis of the article is like there's amount of uh, uh, an amount of emotional intelligence involved with framing your disagreement as well. So you can send out an email saying the work is this way and the person can respond back like I agree with these aspects, I disagree with these aspects and rationale why, not just because. I disagree, which I've seen that happen too in the workplace where a group is clearly attacking for reasons. Not yeah. sure. Not sure. I don't know what their motivation would be. Well, and that's kind of part of it is like sometimes people aren't, <laughs> don't have positive intent. I mean, it's, it's important to know the difference and and how that should elicit a different set of reactions. I mean, we've all been in a presentation where people attacked our work it wasn't because they didn't like the merit, like the they thought our methodology was poor. Yeah, they just didn't like the result, or they didn't want us to be doing it in the first place, or they thought we were stepping on their turf, or what it might, whatever it might be. But those are different circumstances, and it's important to try to kind of understand the circumstance as it's happening. I mean, it, it creates a vicious cycle too. So, like, assuming that everyone starts out like neutral, which they don't, uh, on psychological safety. If uh, you go to a situation where like someone disagrees, the next time, you know, less likely to share ideas. Or if you encounter some sort of like ambiguous criticism of your work, that gets recoded based on your Bayesian priors into this group is attacking me. You mentioned some, like are, are there tactics to better disagree with people? Yeah. You know, one tactic I, I hear discussed often on other podcasts is this concept of steel manning. Have you ever heard of this? You, you brought this up a couple of times, but uh, feel free to. Yeah. It's just being able to state the other person's argument in a way that the other person would actually agree that you understand it. That can diffuse a lot of situations. I think that comes up that I think that does a good description of it. That's really good. And when we covered this like early on in the pod, like, Heck, yeah, it's almost been going like a year now that essentially uh, if you were unable to state the other side's opinion yeah. succinctly, then you don't really understand it. I think we're at the point now where it's okay if we start repeating ourselves. Yeah, absolutely. First of all, I think they're reasonable points to make, and so it might be worth repeating. But second of all, a lot of people probably haven't been listening to every episode. Have you heard of chat GBT, Cole? <laughs> have we talked about chat GBT yet? Let's go full circle. <laughs> um, well, speaking of that, friend of the pod, Max Blumberg, found an article that cites a few people, Daniel Zhu, Dave Ulrich, um, and a few other folks, um, called A System for Analyzing Human Capability at Scale Using AI. And I thought this was some of the best academic literature I had seen in a while. And so what, what essentially these authors were doing is they're, so the, the SEC, the Securities Exchange Commission in the United States that governs publicly traded organizations has started putting in human capital reporting requirements for organizations to share more about their human capital. And what they've done is using AI technologies to scrape that data from these human capital reporting requirements to find dimensions related to that organization's talent, leadership, organization, and human resources operation. And so I just thought this is a fantastic use case of AI based on new pieces of data and bringing it to bear, not just to like, I don't know, try to predict where the stock market's going to go, 
but to try to uh, assess the landscape of talent at different organizations. Very cool stuff. Did you get a chance to look at, the, at this at all, Scott? It, it is cool. It is cool. Uh, I, I got to say, it gave me tired head, like reading through all these acronyms and uh, plowing through it. But uh, the, the general idea is really neat in the sense of like how to explain how your uh, functions drive business outcomes and produce this in an AI way that uh, is also reportable as well. I mean, th this is this is really cool, and I think organizations that start to employ these type of methods are going to be very much on the cutting edge and being progressive analytics teams because there's nothing about this that can't be open source because all the data is publicly available. And so I, I'm really exciting, excited about a future where this type of analysis is done more often. Let's break this down because I, I don't think that I understand it in the same way that you do. Like, how might this be deployed to help businesses? Well, think about it this way. Imagine, like, I'll I'll do it through like the 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 lens of a candidate, okay, and the lens of like an investor, right? From the lens of a candidate, right now, if you're applying to work in an organization, maybe you go to their Glassdoor page and see, you know, what's the culture like, or you know, how much might I be paid via the job description and do some research and to see like how profitable the company is. Imagine if there was an indices out there on multiple talent dimensions that showed how likely you were to be developed at this company, how great the senior executive management is. Do they have an optimized org design? Imagine if that information was publicly available about most like, you know, Fortune 500 companies. That would be a great indicator if you're a candidate on whether or not you would want to work in an organization. And it would be a great motivator to management if they weren't showing up well on these indices to try to improve that at their organization, all right? The second thing would be investors. Investors who are looking into organizations of who to invest in. And a lot of this stuff has always been kind of kept behind the curtain of you, you didn't really know how a company was really run. All you knew were the publicly available financials. Say, in, in companies that aren't investing in talent in the right ways are probably going to get less investment over time and less management makes those changes. And so I think it also leads to putting a chief people officer or a CHRO more in the decision-making factor to how businesses are run. I, I think it's, it's a really exciting development. The, the, it kind of goes along the lines of stuff that you've brought up in the past as well. Like, so on, on one hand, uh, a lot of the information that you have as a candidate or an investor doesn't matter; it's publicly available information. Is aggregated results like uh, your price to earnings ratio and like uh, net income and this sort of thing. But like, if you could break it down by different uh, areas of the business, then you turn, say, your people analytics function from a cost center into a cost generator. And what aspects of that can approve it? Therefore, I think a lot of like HR or people in functions struggle with showing their value to the organization. This sounds like, if I understand it correctly, a, a possible avenue to doing such uh, yeah. uh, a thing. It would, it would be an outcome measure that people analytics teams could measure their effectiveness against. And it could be a longitudinal measure to show that when changes were made to these indices, that the co companies got, you know, more candidates applied to jobs or more investment from investors or had lower turnover and that had the ROI. So it's just going to make it a lot more easily to be tangible in showing the ROI of your function, not to mention all of the benchmarking possibilities that exist, because now you can see how you stack up against your competitors. The, the, this idea of uh, trajectories is like, something I'm like starting to get like really jazzed about a, a lot of our research, you know, based on if it's financial or even people analytics is based on like one shot analyses, you know, like you have one timestamp, but if you had a continuous supply of passive data in some respects, then you can start showing the fluctuations to your point, like because of at this time point, we instituted this policy and therefore we increase uh, or decrease or whatever based on your, uh, the outcome of interest then you can start, really start tweaking the knobs, right? 
you like, yeah. hey, we need to do more of this. And like, maybe part of this is part of the overall functioning and we can't do anything about it. But these other aspects, we can make ourselves much better. And absolutely. And uh, I think this is a good point to bring in uh, a post from Jason Krantz. He said something that I've agreed with, and I think it's related to this, which is like, I think a lot of people analytics teams, to your point, Scott, about being a, a cost center versus generating profit for a business. No. They think that the business fundamentally cares about data and it doesn't. And so Jason <laughs> says, I've said it for years. The business doesn't care about data. Here's what they do care about. Reducing risk, making revenue and profit, acquiring and retaining customers, hitting their objectives and getting paid for achieving those results and supporting core missions and objectives. Data is the tool in the toolbox to achieve better business outcomes. Focus on delivering business value with data and you'll be far more effective than just focusing on data. And so I think yeah. that lends itself to what we're saying is if you have this type of metric to track the, the performance of your people analytics against, now you're not just data, you're doing things that matter to the business. And I think that's absolutely an amazing thing. Yeah, I, I agree with that uh, about the priorities that uh, a lot of people seek. And I, I think this is where any any function within the organization, uh, people analytics or, you know, uh, sales or what have you, like what is the overall mission of the organization and like what's it there to do? That should inform pretty much every aspect of your working life. What we're not in the business of data or the business of yeah, making customers happy, whatever that means for your organization. Well, I think that's probably a good wrapping point, Scott. We haven't had one of these Colin Scott episodes in a while. Feels good. Uh, so yeah, it was good. It's good to chat with you. We'll probably have a few more of these. And I'll just kind of make an exciting announcement. It will have already been gone into effect last week, but we've the podcast is now sponsored by Worklytics. Uh, I know we're both pretty excited about that. And, uh, yeah, so thank you, Worklytics, for enabling us to be able to do what we're doing. You've been listening to Reaction Correct, a People Analytics podcast with Colin Scott. Thanks for listening. As always, all opinions are our own and do not reflect those of any other organization. You've been listening to Directionally Correct, a People Analytics podcast with Colin Scott. 